Now, our second book looks at three other myths about private property. The belief that equality is impossible, the belief that the market economy is more consistent with negative freedom than any other economy, and the belief that the private property system is somehow natural, that this is what people naturally create when they're free from aggression and interference. And uh, we go through, we really, it's not just one history, but it is six histories. We go through the history of all three of these beliefs, showing that people really say these things, they really rely on these as factual claims, as empirical claims. They say, they claim that inequality is impossible. People have been saying this since ancient times. We show that people have said it for a long time and that people are continuing to make this assertion to support the types of inequality we have now. Then we look at the anthropological evidence of different societies and show that there are many societies with very significant levels of, of economic and social and political equality without sacrificing people's freedom or other things that we supposedly sacrifice when we build, when we build economy. We look at this freedom-based argument for the market economy, and then we look at the actual evidence of, well, who gets interfered with in the market economy? Well, the, in the, the people without property. And often those people are simply ignored in the arguments. And if you look at people without property in a private property rights economy and compare them to indigenous peoples without a private property rights economy where land is common and anyone who wants can hunt and gather uh, 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 fish or scavenge as they please, you find that these people have many fewer restrictions on their lives than propertyless people in the world today. And finally, the, the third section of the book and the major section of the book looks at this argument that private property rights are natural. We trace this back to people like John Locke and Thomas More and Hugo Grotius and all these, uh, all these early proto-liberals and show that people have been making this argument since then and to some extent since Roman times and that it continues to be used in, in political theory arguments today, even very often being conceded by its opponents. Opponents of strict private property rights often say, well, we have to sacrifice a little bit of freedom here for greater equality because we're, we're taking away people's natural right to private property. And um, they'll just concede that argument as if it's proven. And then we look at, well, do, how is it supposedly natural? And what the argument for it being natural is, oh, they always go back to telling this story. This, this appropriation story where a man, and it is usually a man in the story, goes into the woods and chops down the trees and makes a farm and says, this is mine and mixes his labor with it and takes something that really was, wasn't very valuable and makes it valuable by, by mixing his labor with it and growing crops on it and actually uses so much less land that he effectively gives land to other people by starting a farm instead of hunting and gathering. And that's a story. Does this ever happen? How do the people who actually appropriate property, these pe the people who really create the first farms, how do, what kind of property systems do they actually develop? And what you find is, that the private property rights system did not develop by men going out in the woods and clearing fields. It developed by European powers having an enclosure movement within Europe where they took away the communal systems that, that peasants had developed for thousands of years within Europe. And then a colonial movement outside of Europe where they took many traditional, complex, overlapping, non-spatial, partially communal, partially collective property systems that existed in many different ways across the world among hunters and gatherers and farmers. And by violence and aggression, they established the private property rights system. 500 years ago, there was hardly a truly private property rights system existing anywhere. A few localized places in Northern Europe had what you could call a private property rights system. And gradually over the last 500 years with these campaigns of violence, they've established this private property rights system. 
So there's nothing natural about the right to property. So when people have this argument, when people have this argument that, oh, you can't tax property to support a basic income because you're taking the natural rights of these people to give to these freeloaders, really the exact opposite of true is you're paying back people on whom you've imposed duties by a 500 year campaign of violence and aggression. And, and you're doing that. So you're, you're, you're compensating people for what's going on in the past, but also you're restoring something that has been lost when access to common land was lost, which is independence. Is that a person with access to common land has independence, has, it, 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 that they don't have to work for someone else. They can work for themselves. Today, the idea that work is anything else but going and getting a job and taking orders all day and then saving enough money maybe to start your own business sometime in life and then you give orders, is that that what is work is about, that is a product of the colonial movement and of the enclosure movement. Long before that, work was something you could do yourself. We have taken away the common right of all people to work for themselves and given them really nothing in exchange and make them subject where they have to go hat in hand to the people who own the resources of the earth and say, may I please work for you? May I please be in your employ? And by doing this, we're taking away people's independence. So what basic income does is it restores that independence since restoring direct access to the commons might be a good thing, but it's impractical for the 37 million people who live in Tokyo or the 35 million people who live in the New Delhi area, uh, it is impractical for all of these people, or for really most of the seven or eight billion people around the world, it is impractical. Basic income restores that independence that you get from access to the commons. And so those are two tandem reasons why we need a basic income in this book, to compensate you from what has been taken away and restore the independence that your lost access to the con commons has lost for you. The book is called The Prehistory of Private Property, Prehistoric Myths in Modern Political Philosophy, Book Two. It'll be out on Edinburgh University Press before the end of this year. And uh, it's really not a book about basic income. The word basic income only appears three times in the book. And those are all on the last uh, page or two of the book. Uh, but of course, in that you can look, well, of course, it's on the last page, you can say, well, in, in a one sense, it's a book that's not really about basic income at all. In another sense, it's a book where the whole argument leads up to basic income. And much like Grant in my last book, which only mentioned basic income once on the very last page. These are not really books about basic income, but they are books that clear some of the ground and show that some of the ammunition that is very often used against basic income and really other forms of redistribution as well are really phony arguments based on false empirical claims. Thank you very much.